this then, like Dali, my horizon line. So I'm conveying the sense of this shape that way. I, I, very, I, I haven't finished this design, so I very crudely clone stamped out the grid on this. But now that you know where these elements have been derived from, can you now pay attention? Can I can now knowledgeably look at this and see these elements underlying the work? Do you see that main rectangle? And I'm also repeating it in other places if you look at the grid. Here's the toe of this figure. The toe, uh, the toe on the other foot comes up where the knee is. This is the back side of the foot. It's hip. And it comes through. I won't make it into that line of the knee here. So that this thrust is in the side. It's right here. It's right here. It's right here coming down. And if you look at it to a lesser degree, you can see this triangle here. So you can convey the sense of solid, solidly drawn geometric shapes by placing things intermittently along the line. Now, um, I don't know how many of you have studied this type of geometry in depth, but I think that's one thing you can take in using your work, regardless of whether or not you were using a grid, or regardless of how far you take your studies of this kind of geometry. That if you are using it along the <coughs> length of a line, such as this extended arm, you can then use that as almost an imaginary line upon which to place other elements. And that will subdivide, that will uh, create a, a geometric, a sense of an underlying geometric structure. Uh, I've also done that here, just the side of the trunk of the tree coming down, you can see here, coming through the, the deltoid that wraps around the pectoralis, comes out of the rich rib cage, it comes down here through the, through the uh, crest of the iliac spine and down through the leg, and it continues again down the other side of that tree. You see how these shapes, how that's continuing through everything, and it conveys the sense of this triangle here. And there's also a, another way of understanding this. Kind of, seems kind of strange, but um, if you want to look at art that way. Next time you're in a museum, think about. I want you to consider how shapes fit into each other, like puzzle pieces. Um, geologists were confronted with this problem before they came up with the theory of Pangea, which is the theory that uh, continents have been separated throughout time. They were always to be one solid landmass. Our inclination to look at positive shapes, uh, I think, sort of postponed that discovery. But you know, if, if geologists are looking at the at the west coast of Africa and finding the exact same soil samples or um, geological evidence that can be found on the east coast of the United States, what does that imply? It implies that those two land masses were once connected. So that if you look at these shapes in between, you can see how they just fit into each other. See what I mean? If we illustrate that. But ultimately, I think there's a pleasing Please sort of arrangement in the way the continents fall here because, because they relate in that way. Well, here's um, the preliminary examples that are preliminary drawings that I did for this. But because I'm using a grid, I can, like the continents, I can sort of create two puzzle pieces that will connect with each other. Like this is a vertical here, this is a vertical here. They have the same stopping point. This is a diagonal here. Diagonal here, same stopping point. This is a vertical here. This is a vertical here. So that if you look at these, you can map this this negative shape in between these two figure groups. They connect. You see how that looks like a puzzle piece, fitting one into the other. And by relating, that's what a grid allows you to do. It allows you to take uh, a distinct figure and a distinct figure group to relate them. And visually, we understand that. We understand that as a, a separate geometric shape in between these two things. I think that sort of lends itself to part of the pleasing nature of this. And this is uh, sort of my conclusion slide. This is actually one book that, uh, probably the best book, I think, from a mathematical standpoint. It's really thin, but this covers the mathematics of the Volman ratio from the very basic description of a linear division that I introduced you at the beginning through you know, much more complex mathematics of fractal geometry. But this idea of the Volman ratio as the most pleasing ratio
ratio uh, has even been accepted by some mathematicians. And if you're in a high school math class or a college math class, very frequently, even the textbooks will have little blurbs in the corner about the phi ratio, the phi rectangle being the most pleasing. So the more it's repeated, the more it's accepted, even though it's not true. And I want everybody to recognize that there's nothing special about the golden ratio. It's about a grid. And so when you see uh, a serious mathematical treatise like this on this topic, uh, sort of placing these random phi rectangles around the, the Mona Lisa space, that makes absolutely no sense. It really doesn't. It's completely arbitrary. There's no evidence for it. These are absurd arguments, and people are correct to criticize them. Um, not only that, but like I was discussing earlier, if you just want to take the definition of the phi ratio, the smaller is the larger, the larger is the whole, that doesn't make sense with this. And all, the, all of the examples I've shown you so far have been about a complete grid that relates all the elements to everything else. So to plot randomly a phi rectangle in the composition is not what it is. So I, I just I wanted to dismiss and get rid of that I want to get rid of that idea and hopefully redirect the conversation, uh, particularly amongst artists, to how we utilize a great system, not a particular patient. Oh, I suppose I can put some questions. Thank you. Bass. I'm an architect and I uh, teach downstairs at the ICA okay. and I give courses on proportion sometimes so I've had some occasion to investigate uh, these things myself. Okay, uh, I've had some, some occasion to investigate these things myself. Right. Um, I, I, I would sort of disagree with what you said on two points, one very minor uh, and one a little more major. One would be that uh, uh, the golden section is not necessarily a number. Which the way you characterize it. It's actually a relationship between numbers. Now, that's right. relatively minor, but it has right. some psychological import. Right. Um, the other thing is that there's not, I, I agree with you that there's nothing special about the golden section if we're only considering material form. <coughs> However, there is something special about it if we see it as a kind of a logos. I don't know if you know what I'm saying. As a kind of a logos. In the Greek oh, sense sure, of a sure. pattern of creation. Yeah. Perhaps I didn't convey that in here. So it, it's it's not. I, and I agree with you that in terms of composition, the grid is more important, and that this kind of thing is not where it's at. So I mean, basically, we're in agreement. But I just would take it to another level, as it were. Sure. And I think maybe if you know, you might want to include that in your presentation in some way. Absolutely. But uh, absolutely, I probably didn't convey that as well as I should have. Um, because these are certainly things I want to stress. Uh, the idea of the golden ratio as the most pleasing ratio cannot be dismissed for its historical importance. It, it, you can't demonstrate it statistically. I, I agree with your presentation on that score, because I've seen those presentations too, and they're not convincing right. one way or the other, really. I mean, you can't prove or disprove anything through those things. It's like trying to prove that astrology is connected to personality. It can't right. be done. Right. Exactly. You either accept the images. I mean, it's a symbolic system. Either you accept it or you don't. Right. And phi is, is a symbolic logos in right. the Greek sense of the pattern of creation. Sure. And that's where it, that's sort of why it won't go away, as it were. And people, in, uh, and, and I agree with the characterization that there are these kind of fundamentalists from the early 20th century who were kind of romantic and reacting to their own time, and that now there's this school, particularly British school, that absolutely denies that anybody ever knew about this stuff, which yeah, is patently is. absurd. Yeah, it is. But I think what they're afraid of, again, I don't know if this is your understanding, but I think what they're afraid of is that there's a platonic connection. Uh, and that underneath it, the platonic universe is based on a divinity. Right. You know, on a metaphysical sure. state. Sure. Absolutely. And absolutely. The, the modern materialist, rationalist school will absolutely not abide by that right. And, right. and not allow it. So they want to deny that this thing, that anybody ever knew about this thing. No, we're in full agreement there. Good, OK. 